It's been over four years since I weighed a beat up Lotus Esprit chassis and got to work on it. Yeah, four years. But in that time, I've also restored a rusty old Mercedes. Finished a Range Rover that wasn't just fit for scrap, that's where it was going, and started a long wheelbase camper van conversion, amongst other things. But the chassis is finished now, and I did everything myself. Things I never would have thought I could pull off in a little garden shed. This last couple of weeks though, as it came time to put the final paint on it, I started getting the heebie-jeebies. Four years of work, okay on and off, started to feel like a shadow looming up behind me. So I've got to thinking, it's okay to accept help when it's available. So before we check out how the chassis weight now compares to its weight back then, let me show you how I've been getting help not to make a mess of things at the final hurdle. You're not getting any more sanding. Two and a half days flatting back for final paint in total, by the way. What I do want to show you is what I've been learning about the level of fastidiousness you have to strive for when you're cleaning something for paint. You see, Garrett Delta Auto Body has half a notion that I might paint the Esprit's body myself when the time comes. I don't really see it, but he started bringing me in on small paint jobs to learn everything from the ground up. And this time, the main lesson was final gun and surface checks before spraying. So let's say you've just cleaned your gun for the job you're about to do. Now you have to blow all of the thinners or whatever solvent you've used out of every nook and cranny so that the chances of contaminating your job with unwanted particles is greatly reduced. Notice I don't say eliminated. Then you've got to go over your paint surface with a tack cloth Gar explained he should have been wearing gloves because your hands are a major source of contaminants. But while rubbing the surface with the cloth, you blow air across it with the gun. See the first part of a spray gun's trigger travel can be feathered to shoot a fan of air without letting paint through. So finally, when you're finished tacking and are ready to shoot, a last go over with a blast of air is just good practice. You might just catch that one stray particle of dust that has landed back on the panel. Whichever hand you hold the gun in, the opposite hand should be in control of the airline at all times. Last thing you want is to lay down a lovely finish and then drag the line through it. So with my crash course done, I was ready to start cleaning the frame. Here's where the lads got another chance to take the mickey out of me. When you've your surfaces dusted best you can, the next step is to run over it with panel wipe to degrease it and remove any contaminants that could react with your paint. The method is to use two cloths, one to rub on the panel wipe and the other to wipe it away. It's your classic Miyagi maneuver. Except when the lads saw my wax on cloth and the amount of fluid I had poured into it, it was more like a that's not a knife, this is a knife kind of vibe.
time to see how much weight the chassis has gained, having had metal replaced where it had gone missing before, plus all of the paint of course. Ok so let's see, back at the beginning when I had stripped it bare of all components but not blasted it yet, it came in at 53.5 kilos. And let's call the piece of wood I had to rest it on the 0.5, although it could have been less. We're gonna say 53 kilos even. Now, resplendent with fresh metal in a number of places, and having had a proper paint regime, minus top coat of course. What? 51 kilos on the nose just goes to show how heavy rust, road dirt, and stray oil can be. I'm kind of blown away. This is where the nervousness got the better of me. All the time and graft I'd put into the chassis and the end was nigh, the spraying tips I'd been getting from Garansai over the past months had shaken my confidence rather than give me more. Ignorance had been bliss and I had been patting myself on the back for not getting runs in the paint the previous times I primed it. I now knew it was because I wasn't getting enough paint onto it. This would be the final coat of epoxy primer, albeit thinned out so that it would flash off quickly. And then we would hit it with a couple of black urethane top coats, having left it a short breather. But it was the last straw when Gar took the air gun to the frame one last time and found dust in it. I asked him, please paint the tricky parts and then shadow me as I do the meat and veg.
doesn't it look gorgeous lying there on its stands soaking up all of the light I'll be talking to patrons in a behind the scenes update about some of the things that are wrong and more of what the Delta boys taught me but suffice to say there were nearly tears of joy in the spray booth I had to do a little bit of manly throat clearing when it was all done Gar got a hug and I knew straight away that the chassis deserved that I pulled the trigger on a half-baked plan I was toying with to make some blingy parts to complement it. And that's how I found myself at Delvo Engineering, a company of stainless steel experts. For I am to make glitzy and rust-proof 316 stainless rear trailing arms for the Esprit. Oh yes. Stephen is the big kahuna at Delvo and he guillotined me a big sheet of 1.5mm stainless steel and I was to go away and mark it up so that all he had to do was help me fold it. Well, maybe I shouldn't be allowed into the little garden shed because I lost two days making a cardboard aided design and then trying to draw up some plans on the extreme plasma machine. By the time I got back to Delvo, I was almost empty handed, save for a very nice cardboard trailing arm. Did you ever hear the story about Colin Chapman infuriating the race scrutineers by presenting a car for inspection with a cornflakes box bulkhead between the driver and the mid engine? No? Another time maybe. Thankfully Stephen started marking the sheet steel without any fuss. And expertly I might add. You'll start to notice as the old arm is moved around the bench how there are dents in it, a lot of pitting, frilly edges where the spot weld seams are being forced apart by rust and if you look into the wide end you can see where there's an area of overlapped plate that has delaminated and started pushing out. They're repairable for sure but it's awkward and shy of taking them completely apart there's no real way of sorting out the spot welded seams. Stephen marked and cut the first and I templated and cut from that to make a second blank. The arms are handed but it's only a case of folding in the opposite direction to make a pair and if you're wondering why I didn't just do this at home with my little sheet metal break I made, I use stock angle lengths for the folding jaw so it has a very rounded edge on it that I've never rectified. The radius it would put into the folds on these arms would be too big and I'm only now realising that the plasma table will allow me to cut new jaws to sort that out. But that's for another day.
To say I have tool envy is an understatement. Bender's girlfriend here is smart too. When I asked how we would allow for the spring back of the metal when we folded it, Stephen said the machine knows. And fingered a few buttons around the back to get her set. He still ran a test fold or two through to make sure we were going to get right angles. But that just being square. See what I did there? Ooh, that rhymes. Lunchtime drew a crowd. Fabricators, sailors and engineers. You know, all the masters of self-sufficiency and backseat driving. They brought the jinx with them too because somehow our first attempt at the small half of the radius arm was a little off. Didn't bother me. I was giddy at the prospect of having a go as well. If you're wondering why I stopped there, it's because my camera stopped there. Luckily I had enough backup battery to get a few final shots while I took advantage of another tool I envy at Delvo Engineering. Everything on the Esprit is imperial in measure. The mounting tubes in the tapered end of the radius arms would originally have been 3 quarter inch outer and likely 7 16 inch inner diameter. I couldn't find that in seamless stainless tube. So I got a length of stock 20mm outer diameter stainless bar and needed to drill an 11mm hole down the centre of it. Starting with a 6mm bit I drilled a pilot and then chased it with a 10.5mm bit erring on the side of caution. See this lathe has a 3 jaw chuck so could run a little off centre making the hole a hair's breadth bigger than a given bit. I could always ream out a 10.5mm hole if it turns out not to be big enough. 
and the lengths needed for the radius arms are only small, so it was an easy job. Tune in next time when I jig the original arms so I can put all the new stainless hardware together and get the bling bolted to the chassis. Want to say thanks to Tommy and Chaz for their shout out on the return episode of the Retro Rides podcast. Wishing you the best of luck with the podcast and projects, lads. You can find that podcast at retro-rides.org and likewise check out Tommy's YouTube channel Tools and Track. Thanks too to Cy, Gar and Roger at Delta for always having my back and to Stephen and the whole gang at Delvo Engineering for entertaining me for a day. To my patrons, Alex Matthews, Michael McAndrew, James Hepburn, Christopher Foskey, Stu Fosk, Steve Snyder, Fred Anderson, Dave Court, Mike Bunce, Stefan Maddock, Rusland Neef to Leave, and Justin Ball. Thank you for getting involved, and I'll see you behind the scenes. That's your tuppence worth for this time. Remember, don't be afraid to get a little help now and then. Stay stuck in, and good luck.